Hey everyone, welcome back. Thanks for your time. There was only a little politics in the Artemis news feed this week, but there was more news and more details to report. Exploration Ground Systems finished stacking the SLS solid rocket boosters for Artemis 2, and I spoke with the group that is going to get Orion ready for launch in a couple of months. So I'll start going into those details in this video. The media got a look at the Gateway Halo module in Italy ahead of its shipment to the US, and I'll go through a few pictures and details that we saw and read. We also saw the first new RS-25 flight engine assembly at the Stennis Space Center, where it is being prepared for its green run slash acceptance test. And I'll note the politics at the end, with the former head of NASA's Exploration Directorate being let go. There's plenty of soap opera coverage to go around, but I'll focus on technical details any chance that I get. So let's take a look at lunar launch preparations and hardware. Following stacking of the 10 loaded solid rocket motor segments of the Artemis II SLS solid rocket boosters, the two forward assemblies were lifted into place in the past week, topping out the SRBs on Mobile Launcher 1 in High Bay 3 of the Vehicle Assembly Building at Kennedy Space Center. NASA KSC Public Affairs posted imagery of the fully stacked boosters online during the week and marked the topping out milestone with a couple of additional feature publications, a blog post and an image feature. The left-hand forward assembly was lifted first on February 17th, followed by the right-hand unit on February 19th. This image was taken on February 14th before that, and from the vantage point of the mobile launcher umbilical tower. In the shot, the forward dome and igniter in the left and right forward segments are covered. We can see one of the vehicle's stabilizer arms in the upper left of the image, and the core stage inner tank umbilical in the lower right. In images taken on February 18th, the left-hand forward assembly is secured in place and the cover has been removed from the right-hand forward segment, although some yellow ground support equipment still covers and protects the top of the igniter. And then the next day, the 19th, the right-hand forward assembly is installed and both boosters are topped out in these images. Closeouts of the previously mated field joints between the loaded segments and between the forward assemblies and the forward segments will continue along with installation of the wiring harness cabling that runs the length of the boosters in the system's tunnel. Wiring for both operational and development flight instrumentation runs from the top of the boosters down into the aft skirts and connects the SLS flight computers with booster avionics and the ground-based launch release system in the firing chain. Now that the boosters are topped out, the next piece of SLS to be stacked is the core stage. That is currently installed in the Core Stage Vertical Integration Center in High Bay 2, undergoing some servicing and maintenance. The last schedule update had the Core Stage to booster mate in March. Following that, the Launch Vehicle Stage Adapter, which is currently stored in High Bay 4, would be stacked on top of the Core Stage. At the end of the week, I interviewed Marcos Peña, who is NASA Operations Manager for Exploration Ground Systems Spacecraft Offline Operations. EGS Spacecraft Offline Operations processes the elements of Orion and SLS in locations outside the Vehicle Assembly Building, where EGS Integrated Operations puts together the whole vehicle on the mobile launcher. For Artemis missions, Spacecraft Offline Operations will receive Orion, the SLS second stage, called the Interim Cryogenic Propulsion Stage, or ICPS, and the Orion Stage Adapter at KSC from Prime Contractors and other NASA programs. Flight commodities will be loaded by EGS on Orion and ICPS in the Multi-Payload Processing Facility, the MPPF. From there, the ICPS will go to the VIB, where Integrated Operations will stack the stage. Spacecraft offline operations will take Orion from the MPPF to the Launch Abort System Facility, where the Launch Abort System will be stacked on the crew module, and then the crew module will be encapsulated. From the LASIF, the Orion Launch Assembly will then head to the VIB for stacking on SLS. Spacecraft offline ops will also process the Orion Stage Adapter that is stacked in between Orion and ICPS. The OSA connects SLS Block 1 vehicles with Orion. EGS will receive secondary CubeSat payloads that will fly in dispensers that are attached on the inside of the OSA. After those CubeSats are installed, the OSA will be ready for stacking on ICPS. I'm good to go. Okay, 
th- I, as always, thanks, thanks everyone for their time. I, I, I appreciate, uh, you know, the opportunity to do this. This meeting is being recorded. This meeting is being transcribed. One second. <laughs> That's fine. I, <laughs> it always happens. I will go through the interview in full detail in a separate podcast, but I'll summarize the news and status takeaways here. First, the Orion environmental test article is still in the MPPF in the deservicing bay. It's been there since just before New Year's, and functional testing of some of the crew module propulsion system is wrapping up. KSC PAO published a few pictures of the ETA when the Artemis II crew visited the MPPF in mid-January. Next, the move of the ICPS to the MPPF is now scheduled for early March, and that's subject to change like everything else. ICPS uses hydrazine as a monopropellant for its attitude control system, and that hazardous loading operation would take place in the MPPF in March before the stage was transported to the VAB for eventual stacking. The third piece of news is that EGS is planning towards a late April handover of Orion from prime contractor Lockheed Martin. That would be followed shortly thereafter by a move of the Orion short stack, the crew and service modules, the spacecraft adapter, and the SAGE panels to the MPPF. The SAGE or spacecraft adapter jettisoned panels are service module launch fairings that cover the SM and spacecraft adapter through liftoff and the first about three minutes of launch. EGS is bookkeeping about five months of work in the MPPF and the launch abort system facility from handover to when Orion would be ready for stacking in the VAB, which would put that milestone in the no earlier than October timeframe. That optimistic estimate possibly could support launch readiness around New Year's 2026, but it's very optimistic because it requires no big hiccups all year while processing Orion and SLS for launch. Three months of the five planned would be in the MPPF and two months in the LASIF. After all the commodities planned to be loaded on Orion are on board, EGS is planning a couple of tests in the MPPF with the Artemis II flight crew. We'll see a crew equipment interface test, or CEIT, again, and then there are plans for a suited test with the crew in launch and entry suits, ingressing and getting connected into their spacecraft. So, as I noted in the big picture video last week, that's what Orion will be doing for most of the rest of the year. While Orion is being prepared for stacking, hopefully in the fall, EGS Integrated Operations will finish stacking SLS, which just bolts the pieces together. After the physical connections, then they'll make the functional connections between the boosters and stages and between SLS and the mobile launcher. And then they'll run through an integrated functional checkout of the rocket systems with ground command and control systems. For the launch countdown, the ground systems run through a highly choreographed and automated sequence until right before the engines start. And here we go. Then they hand over control of the flight vehicle to SLS, which executes the last 30 seconds of the countdown on the vehicle side, while the ground continues commanding all the ground support from pneumatic purges to hydraulic pressure assist to water deluge to hydrogen burnoff igniters. The integrated test and checkout runs through most of that to verify that all the commands go out and the responses come back within spec. Right now, the EGS launch team would work with integrated operations to run through those tests in the VAB during the summertime. While EGS integrated operations is testing and checking out the interoperability between SLS, the mobile launcher, and firing room systems, spacecraft offline operations will be loading most of the flight commodities on Orion in the MPPF servicing stand. Given the outlines we've heard, then in the summertime, Orion would go to the LASIF for the launch abort system tower to be stacked on top and the OGI fairings to be installed, encapsulating the crew module for launch. The hope is that by the end of the summer, Orion will be ready to stack and SLS will be ready for a tanking test. After all the testing and checkout of the systems in the VAB, the highest fidelity countdown simulation would be performed out at launch pad 39B. The launch team will load the cryogenic fuel on the two SLS liquid stages in that high-fidelity countdown simulation, called a tanking test or wet dress rehearsal, depending on how much of the terminal countdown is performed. Things behave differently under full-flight conditions, like liquid hydrogen seals, and EGS has made a lot of modifications and upgrades to the ground systems since Artemis 1. What remains to be decided, or at least announced publicly, 
is whether NASA will do that tanking test with Orion or without it. Talos Alenia Space hosted a media event at their Turin, Italy facility on Thursday, February 20th. The structure for the Gateway Habitation and Logistics Outpost module is being prepared for shipment to the U.S. following structural assembly at Tazi. After the primary structure was completed, it was also load tested and proof pressure tested there. There was one new picture of the module posted on social media showing one of the two radial hatches installed, and we'll be waiting to see what more is released in the coming days. On Friday, my colleagues at NSF, nasaspaceflight.com, published stills and video that Adrian Bile captured in his reporting from the media event in Turin. Adrian posted a couple of stills on social media which show the current state of the HALO structure. This is the view from the end of HALO that will be attached to the power and propulsion element, or PPE, via the inner element adapter. We can see on the far end, the hatch on the axial docking port is open, and on the left we can see that one of the two radio docking ports doesn't yet have its hatch installed. In the image that Talos Alenia Space posted and this one that Adrian posted, we can see that the other radial port hatch is installed. There is a lot more of Adrian's coverage of the media event in Turin in NSF's latest This Week in Spaceflight video. If you haven't already seen it, I'll put a link to that in the description. Once ready, HALO will be transported from Italy to a facility of prime contractor Northrop Grumman's in the Phoenix metro area here in the U.S., where it will be internally and externally outfitted for flight. Then it will be transported to Cape Canaveral for final integration with PPE pre-launch. NASA also posted a feature on Friday about the media event, and interestingly, the feature says that the target date for the launch of the two initial co-manifested gateway elements, the HALO and the PPE, is now quote-unquote no later than December 2027. That was the key decision point 70% joint confidence level schedule baseline that was agreed to at the end of 2023, minus the no later than qualifier. Setting aside the rumors about the future of Artemis for a moment, if the current Artemis plan were retained, PPE and HALO would need to be launched no later than September 2027 in order to support the official Artemis 4 launch date of September 2028. That's because it will take at least 12 months for the PPE solar electric propulsion system to spiral the CMV out from where the expendable Falcon Heavy releases it in something approximating a geostationary transfer Earth orbit to the gateway orbit, also known as a near rectilinear halo orbit, or NRHO. Or, more specifically, a southern L2 NRHO in a 9 to 2 resonance with the lunar synodic period. But that's getting ahead of things. For now, the feature included a newly seen or newly published shot of the PPE spacecraft in assembly, courtesy of prime contractor Maxar. Unfortunately, even if it is really newly published, it still appears to have been taken in 2024, so it's already going on at least three months old, maybe older. On Tuesday, February 18th, L3 Harris published news that their first flight engine build under the RS-25 restart program was complete and being installed in the dedicated single-engine test stand at Stennis Space Center for an acceptance test. The new flight engine is designated Engine 20001. It is the second full build of RS-25 production restart components, following Engine 10001, which put together parts from all the restarted component production lines for a certification test series that completed in 2023. The emphasis on component production is because the RS-25 engines, formerly known as Space Shuttle main engines, are mostly composed of highly interchangeable line replacement units. During the shuttle program, when the engines were reused, the high-pressure and low-pressure turbopumps, valves, ducting, controller, nozzle, and other parts were often taken off one engine, serviced, and put on another. Formerly under Aerojet Rocketdyne and before that a few other business combinations, L3 Harris builds those pumps and other main pieces, such as the hot gas manifold, main combustion chamber, the main injector, and the pre-burner injectors, and then those are shipped to send a space center for final assembly and to maintain an inventory of spares. In contrast to ground test engines, this new flight engine will only be ground tested a minimal number of times. 
it's possible that this acceptance test would be the only ground start needed until it flies. It is currently assigned to the core stage for Artemis 5. NASA published a larger set of still images showing the new flight engine leaving the L3 Harris final assembly facility at Stennis, being trucked over to the Fred Hayes test stand, formerly known as the A1 test stand, and then lifted up and installed there. In these shots, we can see the difference between the fuel and oxidizer pumps and the large low pressure ducts, with the hydrogen or fuel side ones being insulated. We can also see the blanket-like thermal insulation on the nozzle hat bands and drain lines. On the political front, NASA Associate Administrator Jim Free was let go this past week. Mr. Free announced his resignation effective at the end of the week, but when he was bypassed as acting administrator by President Trump on January 20th, the proverbial writing was on the wall. Mr. Free was Associate Administrator, overseeing operations across all the directorates, but only for about a year since Bob Cabana retired at the end of 2023. Prior to that, he was the head of the Exploration Systems Development Mission Directorate, which is where the big-ticket programs that NASA branded as Artemis are. With the fate of those programs in the Directorate in doubt in the new administration, this move to let Mr. Free go doesn't disrupt the existing narratives or rumors that big changes are coming. Thanks as always for watching. Click on the like button if you found this video informative. We'll hope for more opportunities to dig into Artemis technical details this year, but that soap opera narrative that the Trump administration is eventually going to do to Artemis, what Elon Musk said he wants to do to the International Space Station, that's not going anywhere.